So tonight we have with us from Indiana Wildlife, Aaron Stump, and he's going to tell us a little bit about our friendly animals and plant uh, things like that for the neighborhood. So Aaron, if you'd like to talk to the group. Thanks, Barb. So thank you guys all for having me. Thank you for coming. I know you probably were going to come anyways, but I appreciate you coming to this one that I'm doing. Uh, my name is Aaron Stump. I'm the Habitat Programs Manager with the... By the way, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, I'll try to talk a little louder. I'm the Habitat Programs Manager with the Indiana Wildlife Federation. Um, basically what that means is I manage our big programs. Uh, I'm just going to... I'm very aware of the fact that I have, I'm short on time today, so if I rush or stumble or don't make sense, please stop me and let me know. Um, I manage our big programs. The two that I would talk about today, the trails program is the one that's sort of just about to take off. Uh, we have a bunch of certified trails all across Indiana. You can read more about them on our website. Um, we also have the certified backyard wildlife habitat program. Started with National Wildlife Federation and we decided to make this presentation to sort of get the word out there and get people excited about inviting wildlife into their backyard where a lot of us would try to exclude wildlife from our backyard. So the first thing I want to do before we get started is ask just for a show of hands of who has actually heard of the Indiana Wildlife Federation before today? Good, that's a really good showing. Um, most people are aware of the National Wildlife F uh, Federation, Ranger Rick and all that. By the way, if you're fans of Ranger Rick, if you have kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, whatever, I do have some subscriptions to some Ranger Ricks in the back. I have a limited supply, but you are welcome to them. We also have NWF's um, Gardening for Wildlife magazine uh, as well. You're welcome to take those. Um, I'm going to get right into this presentation just so I can uh, just so I can get you guys out of here on time. By the way, is it possible to, can you see the presentation okay? Do we need to kill these lights? So I, I want to talk about native plants. That's sort of my specialty. That's what I, that's what I actually know things about. Uh, and I call native plants the foundation to all of conservation. And real quick, that white sheet, the boring one that I passed out, has definitions on it. So if you're like, what in the world is a native plant? It's on there just so we can be clear. Sometimes these terms get uh, misused or uh, they get uh, switched around and can, can get confused. So I want to make sure you guys are all straight when I'm using these terms. So it doesn't matter what kind of wildlife you care about. Anybody a bird watcher? Anybody like, uh, is, does anybody like insects? Insects are a pretty cool thing. Yeah, okay. So if you like butterflies, bees, bobcats, good. If you like butterflies, bees, whatever you like, whatever you're into, it all starts with native plants. So we can all provide that habitat in our backyards, in our homes, no matter how small the space, uh, by utilizing native plants. Um, I do want, I had a question a minute ago that I kind of wanted to address. I like to address misconceptions uh, that are asked to me a lot, and one of them is I have butterfly bush, is that the same as butterfly weed? So when I talk about native plants, butterfly weed is the native plant. It means it provides a host plant for butterfly species. Butterfly weed might provide nectar, but it doesn't provide a host. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about natives. So if you care at all about conservation, you've probably heard about monarchs and milkweeds until you're probably sick of it, but I'm going to talk about it just a little bit more because they're a fantastic species to demonstrate uh, exactly why we need native plants and why we need more native plants and why insects are a good thing to have in our gardens. So I talk to a lot of garden groups and it's very hard to convince ornamental gardeners that it's beautiful when you have a plant that's been completely defoliated by insects by midsummer, when it's got no leaves left on it and it looks pitiful. That's actually a wonderful thing. So there's, those are people who are thinking about the beauty of their flowers. I wanted to get a, to see beauty in a little bit different light. So the monarch is a uniquely American species. It's our only migratory butterfly. Indiana sits right in the middle of what's called the migratory highway. So it's right where those butterflies are passing when they're coming up from Mexico in the spring and when they're going back to Mexico in the fall. So we're actually a really point, important way station for those monarchs to nectar and to host and to keep their species going. By the way, this year's a really good year for monarchs. They had record numbers. It hasn't been this high in like the last 10 years. Uh, IWF does a monarch tagging, if you're interested in citizen science, um, on the White River in downtown Indianapolis. So if you want to come out and actually handle butterflies, put a sticker on them, uh, send them on their way back to Mexico. We do that in the fall in September. You can send me an email or look on our website. Um, so the monarch is a really cool insect. The female butterfly, in her lifetime, can lay about 700 eggs. That's a lot of eggs, but she's not stupid. She wants to survive and keep her species going, so she doesn't want to lay all 700 eggs on one plant. Because your typical swamp milkweed, which is maybe four or five feet tall and yay big around, one plant will host about four to five caterpillars from egg to adult. That's it. And she's looking to lay 700 eggs, and she wants them all to survive. So she's trying to lay those eggs on as many plants as she possibly can. 
So not only do we need milkweed to support those insects because they can't feed on anything else, um, they actually require milkweed. In fact, something like 96% of all insect species are what's called species-specific eaters, which means they can't just host on any plant. They need a very specific plant. For monarchs, it's milkweed. You know, if you have spicebush swallowtail, which is a really hard one to say, I should have picked a different one, they need spicebush to host on. Um, so that's, that's why we not only need milkweed, we need a lot of milkweed because we want to have a lot of these caterpillars in our ecosystem. And again, why do we want to have a lot of caterpillars? Why does that matter? They don't seem that important. Well, for guys like this, this Carolina chickadee. So there's a guy named Doug Tallamy who's pretty well known uh, if you're into uh, ecology and things like that. He's got a book called Bringing Nature Home, which I recommend. It's very cool. He did a lot of research on uh, topics like this, on how, how is the food web working? What kind of impacts are we having on ecology? And one of, the, one of the, the animals he chose to look at was the Carolina chickadee. So he found that a typical clutch of chickadee is maybe four or five uh, maybe four or five uh, hatchlings, so when they emerge from their eggs. And he found that by the time they go from hatchlings emerging from their eggs to fledglings, when they're basically starting to fend for themselves, it's about 16 days. And in that time frame, the adult chickadee couple has to bring back to the nest between six and 9,000 caterpillars over the course of about 16 days. So if you think about how many caterpillars you might see in your backyard you know, over the course of a couple of weeks, it's probably not six to 9,000. Doug wanted to know why is that? Why are we not seeing insects the way we used to? So he looked at two different trees. He, or he looked at you know, two different trees. He looked at one that is uh, invasive, which again, that word is on your sheet, uh, and is all over my neighborhood. I don't know about yours. Called the calorie pear. It's uh, it's an ornamental tree from Asia. It was hybridized. We we didn't think it was going to be uh, a problem, but it turned out it was not a, a good tree to have around. We don't want it in our ecosystem. Doug found that about that one of those calorie pears hosts about five species of Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera is just moths and butterflies. Then he looked for comparison at our native oak trees, and he found that our native oak trees host about 530 species of Lepidoptera. So when we're starting to wonder, when we see all these neighborhoods like mine that sort of pop up overnight, and we say, why are the insects disappearing? Almost my entire neighborhood is invasive trees. It's calorie pears and Norway maples that nothing lives on. And so those birds are struggling to find food in those ecosystems. And this kind of relationship can be seen all throughout nature where something is dependent upon something else and when you're lacking in one, you, the other one suffers. Now if you want to go to sleep or, or, or tune out for the rest of this, that's fine. <coughs> Remember this one phrase, do this for me, biodiversity is key. That's really all I care about. So when I tell people, you know, I get asked a lot, what should I plant in my house? I've got space for about 50 plants. Should I put 50 milkweed in my garden? I say, I love the monarch butterfly. 50 milkweed sounds great, but I would rather see 50 of uh, one different kind of species, 50 individual species, one plant of each species, than 50 milkweed. Because biodiversity is what we really need in our ecosystems. Because just like those uh, insects that only feed on one plant, sometimes there's animals higher up that only feed on one type of insect. And if you're not providing that, you won't see that wildlife. So I, I, I like to talk about this story from one of our board members. Uh, you might be wondering why you have uh, a dried piece of plant uh, at your chair. I had a board member who came to me who was not really into native stuff at the time. And he asked, uh, uh, he, he said, when I, was, when I was a kid, I used to go fishing down by the pond. I would chop down these reeds. And when I'd split them open, I'd find these little grubs inside. And I'd go fishing with those because they worked better than anything I could buy at the tackle store. The fish loved them. And he didn't know it at the time, but what he was doing was cracking open these uh, reeds. And the ones you have are sweet joe pie. Uh, it's one of my favorite native plants. It's beautiful. It smells fantastic. It's a great pollinator plant. And he was actually digging out native bee larvae. So most native bees are not what we think of when we think of We might usually think of the European honeybee, which is sort of a domesticated species, lives in hives. We use them to pollinate a lot of our uh, gardens, industrial uh, orchards, and places like that. Native bees are typically solitary. Uh, some, like bumblebees, will nest in small hives of maybe 50 to 100. They're small, they're not that big, they usually nest in the ground. Native bees are solitary, and they like to nest in things like these little reeds. So what they'll do is they'll dig a little hole in the side, lay a larva inside, then cap it off with wax, and then fly away. And that larva lives in that reed, and you would never know that there was a larva in that reed unless you did what Chuck did, and you split it open and looked inside. So, I guess maybe it was because of nostalgia, Chuck decided he was going to plant some of that Joe Pye weed. And uh, what we failed to tell him was that it grows to be about seven feet tall. 
I don't take responsibility for the fact that he planted it by his mailbox. That was before my time. <laughs> so he has to deal with that. I also want to talk just really quickly about coevolution and human impact. Um, this is kind of a negative topic. I don't want to take too much time. I don't want you guys to feel bad when you leave here. But there are some things that we're doing that we have to talk about. Uh, there's a really interesting documentation of the Japanese uh, cherry blossom tree from Japan. So it's a really important tree to their culture. Because of that, they've kept records of its bloom times uh, going all the way back to about 800 AD, they have written records. And what those written records show are really boring for a very long time. But then recently, they start showing the bloom times of those cherry blossoms coming a little bit earlier and a little bit earlier and a little bit earlier. And what's happening is because of our warming temperatures, those plants that are sensitive to the amount of light that they get, so the, the daylight hours they get, are also sensitive to temperature. And so they think spring is coming a little bit before it's actually there. The native bees there don't realize that. That's not the way they operate. So the bees are not ready when the flowers are. The flowers are coming out sooner. And the issue is these two species, like so many species, I've got, this is bee balm, and that's actually a European honeybee, but it's a great picture of a bee covered in pollen, so I used it anyways. These two species evolve together, and they have a, a relationship that makes them dependent upon one another. So these flowers are insect pollinated only. That means they have to have some kind of insect come in and remove their pollen and take it to another plant. Uh, and these bees only get food from flowers. That's where they get their nectar. So when their life cycles, the overlap in their life cycle starts to move farther and farther apart, there's a disparity, which means the flowers have less time to get pollinated and the bees have less time to gather food for their hives. So we are creating a situation where we're threatening these two species, uh, basically just by causing one to behave a little bit more differently. But because they've evolved together for so long, they aren't prepared to deal with that. I am going to talk about my least favorite invasive species slash, I guess it's my favorite, I talk about it all the time, the calorie pear. So I like to talk about the calorie pear um, by using a reference from what is one of the greatest movies ever made, Jurassic Park. Everybody agrees with that, right? Okay. <laughs> At least if you're close to my age, you might agree with that. I don't know. So the calorie pear is a crazy species. When it was first introduced, we were told, don't worry, it's sterile. It cannot reproduce. It's not capable of reproduction. Well, we've heard all that before, right? The problem was, well, I think we were all warned by Dr. Ian Malcolm, right, when he said life uh, finds a way, and the calorie pear did, and basically through us. So we loved this tree so much as, a, as an ornamental species, we started creating different hybrids of it. So you've heard of maybe the, the Cleveland Select. The calorie pear is sort of the big overarching name for it, the Bradford. There's all these different kinds of pear trees that we started creating, and it turned out that those trees could breed. And so we, what we ended up with were dinosaurs all over Indiana. Okay, that's not, that's not actually true. We ended up with this. It might be a little bit hard to see, but this is sort of a, an unmaintained roadside, right? A forest roadside that uh, doesn't get regular clearing. All of these trees in here that are white and green in the bottom are calorie pears. Now what's happened is those calorie pears were put in our neighborhoods. The seeds were taken to these woodland edges area, which is a really popular location for birds. That's where a lot of bird and insect activity takes place. And they dropped the seeds. They deposited the seeds there in that... Uh, that small roadside area, and they, they started to take over this, this section. Now, you'll notice some of the native trees, they're probably maples and sycamores and things like that. They don't have their leaves on their branches yet, if you look at the top of those trees. The calorie pears are already green. They're putting out their flowers, and that's why they're so successful in our ecosystem. They put out leaves before anything else does. They shade out everything underneath them that would normally pop up, and then they start providing a nectar source for all those insects that are looking for early spring flowers. So instead of going to our spring ephemerals, these bees are going to these invasive trees and continuing the, the spread of that invasive population. Another one that we have a pretty good relationship with, apologize for hitting the mic, that we have a pretty good relationship with at IWF are Asian carp. So half of our staff is actually dedicated to working on the Asian carp issue up near Lake Michigan. Now there's only four people that work at IWF, so it's not that impressive, <laughs> but it's a good percentage of our staff. Uh, you can see this is not this is not a good situation if you are a recreational boater. Imagine this being Lake Michigan. There is something like an eight and a half billion dollar a year industry in Lake Michigan, whether it's recreational boating, whether it's industrial fishing, whatever it is, that is threatened by this invasive species that leaps out of the water whenever something disturbs the water surface and are huge. These fish can be massive and they're bony and they're dangerous. So if you're a recreational boater like one of these families and one jumps out and hits your kid in the face, it can cause serious damage, and it has happened. Another one I have to talk about is actually a really good example from Indiana. 
so one of my least favorite things to talk about is the money aspect of conservation. It's just not something that I find very appealing. But the emerald ash borer really brought it to the forefront uh, in Indianapolis specifically. So the ash tree is a fantastic native tree. It's a great host. Uh, it's a beautiful urban tree. It grows, uh, it's got great, gr great growth habits. Uh, it looks pretty. It hosts a lot of wildlife. It's, it, it can tolerate a lot of pollution. So they planted the Indianapolis canopy about 20% ash. And what happened was we started hearing in about 2003, 2004, this emerald ash borer coming in. And there is a treatment that you can apply to ash trees. You may have heard of it if you have ash trees in, in your yard, if you have a big ash tree in your yard. But it can be prohibitively expensive. It can be thousands of dollars over the lifetime of the tree. And it has to be over the lifetime of the tree. It's not a one-time uh, treatment. Um, and another issue with it is it's a broad spectrum pesticide. So it kills everything that feeds on the tree, even the native stuff that we want to keep. So basically, whether you treat it or not, that tree is coming out of the ecosystem, right? But we love the ash tree. Indianapolis decided we can't afford to treat these trees. There's too many of them. It's not feasible. We don't know what to do. We've got to leave it. Leave it. Ash borer moved in like we thought it would, and it killed all of them. So now what we have are these dead ash trees lining all of these major roadways, uh, sidewalks, the bike lanes. Uh, parks, all these places where they're now starting to pose a safety hazard because they've died, years are starting to go by, they're dropping limbs and branches. And now Indianapolis has to say, we couldn't afford to treat them, how are we going to pay to remove them? That's, that's almost as expensive, right? So when we, when we think about invasives, there's a lot of different reasons that it's so important to, to face them. It's also one of the reasons I encourage people to say, I know it stinks to think about spending money to do preventative stuff to, to these invasive species, but we're going to pay for it one way or another eventually. I think it's better to pay for it right up front and try to prevent this kind of stuff, just like we are with the Asian carp, than to worry about going in and mitigating the disaster that comes afterwards. So I have to talk for just a moment about my personal crusade. And this is partially because I'm a conservationist and partially because I'm really lazy. I want to get rid of all lawns. I don't like lawns, mainly because I don't like mowing mine in the middle of the Indiana summer. So I tried, to, I tried to think, how could, I, how could I convince other people to get rid of their lawns? And uh, my background, my degree is uh, in actually in water quality. That's not a very sexy topic. Nobody wants to sit around a table and listen to me talk about water quality. So I thought I would take a pretty well-known uh, graphic. I think National Geographic did a really good photo session on this where they, they planted a bunch of pr uh, prairie plants, and then they bisected the soil after a few years to show off the root systems of everything from the grasses we use in our lawns to all these native uh, prairie plants. And they made a, a graphic of it. But instead of a slide, because my wife is a craftsy person, she has an entire room full of yarn scraps, I decided to raid her room. And I hope you can see these. I decided to make some of those things for myself. So this is a depiction of our typical uh, lawn grass. The roots go down about four to six inches. If you ever dug a hole in your lawn to plant a tree or something, you know the roots aren't very deep. Our board member, Chuck, he's always got a story. Uh, he also says, there's only three things that like a lawn, geese, grubs, and humans. And I don't want to be a part of that group anymore. So he's tried to convert some of his lawn. I've tried to convert some of my lawn. And he's absolutely right. Japanese beetles, if you've got a Japanese beetle problem, it's because you have a lawn. This is where they live. If you have a goose problem, it's because you have a lawn that you're mowing. And what those geese want are those tender little shoots that pop up after you mow your lawn. So these lawns are causing us a lot of headaches, but we kind of don't like the idea of getting rid of them because it's something we're kind of used to. So I'm trying to normalize native plants by getting them out there in the world so people will walk by some native plant garden and say, OK, I've seen that before. That looks familiar, instead of, what are these weeds doing here? So this is one of the, uh, this, is, this is just a, a non-native grass that we like to plant for decorative reasons. This is a pretty common uh, native plant, Echinacea purpurea. It's uh, a purple cone flower. You've probably seen this in almost any garden. Well, these roots are a little bit different. So if you were to dig up a mature purple cone flower, and if you've ever tried to divide one of these in the fall, you'll know these roots get pretty tough. They're pretty tough to divide. These roots can get down about five feet in the soil. Now you can imagine what this does for water quality. This is doing a lot better job at filtering that water. If you've ever seen your lawn in a heavy rain, it, it does this process called sheeting, where it, it floods and then it runs off your lawn real quick. I have a drainage easement in my backyard that after a quarter inch of water, it's basically a little river back there. That's because those lawn roots don't go very deep. That water can't go very deep. But with plants like these, that water's going down much farther. It's being filtered through this natural system so that when it gets to our rivers and streams, it's not polluted and filthy. Another native 
And this is one of my favorite grasses. Right about now, it's not coming up yet. It's still a beautiful sort of golden sound, uh, golden color. It, it kind of rustles in the, uh, in the wind in the winter. It's a beautiful uh, grass. It's called switchgrass. And just for a demonstration of how different these roots are, it actually has two different kinds of roots. So the number one pollutant in our rivers and, wa in our, uh, river wa rivers and waterways today is not nitrogen, it's not phosphorus, it's not herbicides, pesticides, it's sediment. It's from soil that's eroding off into our rivers and streams and polluting them. Now you can imagine the, those four to six inch little roots aren't doing a whole lot to hold that soil in place. This has a big sort of clump of hairy roots right at the top and they're working real hard to keep that soil where it is. So these plants are great for for uh, erosion, they're great if you've got a, an eroding bank, a collapsing bank to help stabilize it and keep it in place, keep the sediment where it belongs and not in the water. And these deep roots are doing a fantastic job getting water down into the water table, filtering everything out. And it's also important to remember that these roots are habitat too. There's stuff that lives under the soil that needs these root systems to survive. What's that called again? It's called switchgrass. And then last but not least, this is a really, you've probably seen this one quite a few times in Indiana too. Uh, it's got a lot of different names, Bla Blazing Star, Gay Feather, uh, the Liatris is its name. Uh, it's a prairie plant, it's one of the prairie plants in Indiana. Uh, it's a little more common out west, but it does really well here too. Let's see if this works, this never works for me, but we'll give it a shot. <laughs> Almost, right? So these roots, they can get to be about 15 deep, feet deep in the soil. Now, there's a good reason for that. Like I said, this is a prairie plant. So as you can imagine, it doesn't rain as much in the prairie as it rains in grasslands and places like we have mostly in Indiana. So these plants need to be able to access water after long periods of drought. With 15 feet uh, deep roots, they can get to that water for a very long time. So if you get a drought at your house, you'll see your lawn turns into those horrible brown needles that you're afraid to walk on real quick unless you water it. These plants are going to stay beautiful and green because they can access water that, that uh, surface level grass can't. Um, this is a picture of, uh, just a random uh, picture of a house that I took. I call it the Greenwood Dream Home. It looks like a fantastic place to live. In my opinion, it's a great house. I'd love to live there. And the, the picture on the left is of one of our board members who converted his lawn into a native garden. I know that this is a really appealing picture. I have a hard time not looking at it and sort of drooling too. But what I like to do is ask people to change their perspective a little bit. So don't look at it like you're a human. Look at it as if you are a pollinator, if you're a bee, or if you're allergic to bees, if you're a butterfly, you know, whatever you want to be. What do you see when you're flying over this property? Well, that big bright green lawn is probably not a place that you're going to want to nest. If you like to nest in mud and dirt and things like that, or if you like to nest in reeds. Uh, it's probably also treated. I don't see a lot of, uh, uh, of clover and dandelions in that lawn, so I'm assuming that's a pretty heavily treated lawn. It's got a lot of manicured topiaries, which look great to us, but to wildlife, that just doesn't provide everything that they need. In fact, for most insects, it's not going to provide a host. Those are probably not even native uh, greens. Those trees, I don't know what they are, I'm guessing calorie pears. Um, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm an optimist, I promise, but I still think those are calorie pears. But what do you see if you're an insect and you're coming to this house on the left? Well, there's a lot of biodiversity, a lot of different plants. It almost doesn't matter what you are, there's probably something there for you. So I'm going to wrap up by talking about the, uh, the whole premise behind this presentation was to talk about the Certified Wildlife Habitat Program and how you have to sa satisfy the four needs of wildlife. So I'm just going to run down basically the four needs and how you can provide those at home. So the first one up is food. Pretty obvious. Um, remember that insect species um, are plant specific so they like biodiversity and that those insects, those are also a food source for something else. <clears throat> and then these are just some ideas of how you can provide those food at home. By the way, is anybody a bird watcher? Anybody like the cedar waxwing? One of my favorite birds, they look like they've been painted, they're so beautiful. That's a cedar waxwing feeding on a service berry. It's a great tree if you want to attract uh, uh, cedar waxwings and other birds like that. Um, if you have non-natives at calorie pear, you just probably won't see them as often. Which brings up another point. I'm getting sidetracked because I always do. Uh, honeysuckle, a lot of people tell me, I love my honeysuckle because the birds and the bees love it, is I'm providing a service to nature. Well, what they found out when there was a study done on the berries of those honeysuckle is that they're really high in sugar and carbohydrates and low in protein. So we started calling it the candy bush a good healthy uh, fruit for bees to be eaten. It's not going to get them through uh, the year very well. But yeah, you can provide hard, hard mass, soft mass, nuts and berries. Uh, one of the things I like to point out is uh, uh, I put artificial last. You can still provide artificial uh, uh, food sources for animals, but it's important that 
You recognize the potential for disease spread. If you're asking a lot of animals to congregate at one or two feeders, that's a potential vector for disease and needs to be cleaned out pretty regularly. So it's a thing you can do, but as always, the native plants are going to be the best option. Next is water. I addressed the one concern I got every single time I gave the presentation in the beginning, which is I can't have standing water at my house because I don't want mosquitoes. Mosquito life cycle is about 10 days. If you dump your water bowl or your bird bath or whatever you've got every 10 days and clean it out, you're not going to have a mosquito problem. If you do, it's because there's an upturned bucket somewhere, there's a standing puddle that's not draining, your neighbor's got a tire in the yard, something like that. Because only mosquitoes can survive in that two inches of water in an upturned tire. Nothing else. Nothing else that would normally feed on them in the wild is going to survive there. They're very, very hardy species. And then I always like to say size doesn't matter when it comes to water. Even if you have an apartment and the best you can do is put out a butterfly dish with a piece of fruit in it, butterflies will flock to that. That's doing a great service for them. Um, before I get to shelter, I always get a reaction from this post because there's a possum on it. Does anybody here else, uh, anybody else love the possum? Tell me somebody loves possums. Okay. <laughs> Just want to share this with you, even though I may not be converting anybody. <laughs> there was a study done on possums recently. Uh, that was trying to, to figure out Lyme disease. They were trying to figure out vectors for Lyme disease because Lyme disease is becoming more and more prevalent uh, as the climate warms up. And they studied the possum. So they found out some really cool stuff. First, the possum is our only native marsupial. And because of that, they have a little bit different behaviors than a typical mammal. It turns out they're really fastidious groomers. They clean themselves all the time. They're more like a house cat, which they may not look at, but they're actually very clean animals. What the study found was that they were going through the woods and collecting all these ticks, just like every other mammal, but because they cleaned themselves so much, they were actually destroying them or consuming them, in some way getting rid of the ticks on their body. And they found that a single possum in one season can destroy about 5,000 ticks. That's about, so it's, that's about 90% of the ticks that host on them, which means they are a net destroyer of ticks. They destroy more ticks than they allow to breed. And that's a really cool uh, that's a really cool fact about them. They also have a little bit lower body temperature than your typical mammal, so you don't have to worry as much about rabies with them. They, they have about a 94 to 97 degree body temperature, which is inhospitable to the rabies virus, so they're really poor carriers of rabies. They're not likely to be uh, rabid. I still wouldn't recommend handling any wildlife, but it's just something to keep in mind. So shelter. We talk about two different kinds, thermal shelter and escape cover. They're just like what they sound. Thermal shelter is where can an animal go when it's raining? Where can they go when it's really hot out and the sun's beating down just to get out of the elements? And then escape cover. So my neighborhood is a lot of really immature trees. I have rabbits everywhere because there's nothing but grass, which means I also have hawks everywhere. And so those rabbits are looking for some place to hide when that hawk shadow passes overhead. My switchgrass that I showed you earlier is a great place for them to get underneath. Uh, there's a few different examples down here. One that I like to point out, because again, I'm lazy, is the leaf litter. You may not see it, but in the fall, there is a really, uh, really fascinating moth um, called the leopard moth. The caterpillar will find a fallen leaf and wrap it around itself and cocoon inside over winter. And it stays there until spring when it emerges and flies away. The problem with that is we don't see that. And so when we go through with our lawn mowers and mulch up that, those, that leaf mass, or when we rake it up and, and bag it, we're destroying those uh, caterpillars. And they're a beautiful moth. It's something we, we'd want, we should want to protect, not just because they're beautiful, but they are beautiful. So what I like to recommend people do is maybe instead of destroying those leaves, you can utilize them on your property. I rake all my leaves into my garden beds because that's mulch. Mulch is just a decaying plant matter that protects the surface of our gardens and keeps them from, from freezing too hard. Um, those leaves are just as good a mulch as anything you can buy at the store, maybe even better. Um, and it is, a, again, an excuse to be a little bit lazy. Rake them up into a, a pile around your trees. It'll provide a nice cover for the tree root system. It'll prevent a little bit of soil erosion. Uh, and you're saving those, those moths that you would never normally see. And then again, I put artificial at the bottom. I don't know if you guys are like me, I'm super clumsy. So this is just like one of those little terracotta pots that I dropped and broke. And we painted it and we put it out in the garden for a little toad abode. Sometimes you'll find a toad in there. <laughs> Typically not. But it's just a way to you know, be creative if you break something. Things always have another use. And then last but not least, uh, providing nesting opportunities is obviously important. These animals have to have a place to rear their young. Um, this is the one where Typically, I, I, I give a little more lenience to saying artificial is a good one because it's kind of hard to have. Not everybody can have a big dead tree in their backyard and say, yeah, it's providing a house for a raccoon. I'm going to leave it there. I know I couldn't. I would get in big trouble for that. <laughs> so, you know, providing bat boxes. I showed you those plant stems that are hollow inside. Whenever you see these bug hotels that look like they have little pieces of bamboo sort of stacked up and corded inside them, that's where they got that idea from. They didn't, people didn't come up with this on their own. They noticed that animals are nesting in these different sized cavities 
and they just created them using bamboo. So if you have something like Joe Pie, you can chop it down in the spring, bundle it up, and use it as a, uh, you know, as a little insect hotel. And then, of course, uh, security. If you have a, 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 a bluebird house in a yard where your cat's playing, that's not a secure nesting location. That's a buffet for your cat. <laughs> and then, of course, I want to mention uh, the whole purpose of this presentation is uh, to sort of uh, uh, tell everybody about the Certified Wildlife Friendly Habitat program that we run. Uh, it's run through National Wildlife Federation. You can read more about it on our website. I have some materials back there on the table if you're interested in it. You can read more about that. And then lastly, we're a membership-based organization. We uh, get all of our funding, all of our support. Everything we do comes from our members. So I would be slacking on my duties if I didn't ask you guys to, to find some way to help us out, whether you're joining as a member. Hosting a workshop like you did here is a great way to, to help us out. And before I go, I think I may have a couple minutes. I don't really know at this point. Uh, I, get, I, I always get the question afterwards. People sort of ask me on the slide. They don't want to say it out in the open. Why in the world should I be a member? What do I get? And of course, my answer should be, well, it's not about what you get, it's about what you give, right? But that's kind of corny. Nobody wants to hear that. So what, what has come to our attention recently is that not everybody is up to date on all the different legislation that's going on uh, in Indiana regarding wildlife. So did you guys know that there was a, uh, a bill proposed to bypass the DNR to allow bobcat hunting, to take a species away from the management of the DNR? Did you know that there's Asian carp legislation going on right now, that the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative being defunded wildly, that Orsenko, which protects uh, the Ohio River Valley, is, is being attacked? All these things are happening, and I don't expect any one of you to know all about that stuff because you have a lot of other stuff going on in your life. What your $30 membership would buy is a seat at the table. So I always tell people that if you don't have a voice in your legislature, I guarantee you the people who have interests antithetical to yours, companies that want to dump stuff in rivers, companies that want to uh, use, our, use and abuse our resources, they have a voice at the table. They have money in the game. And if you don't, don't be surprised when legislation doesn't go the way that you want it to go. So what IWF tries to do, and what we've tried to do since 1938 when we were founded, is be a voice for the masses. We've always been a voice, typically it was for hunting and fishing and conservation. We've changed, we've broadened our scope. We're, we're, we're for uh, all, all different aspects of conservation now, and we need as many people as possible to make a, as big a voice as possible. And that's what you're sort of buying into. Plus, we have some pretty cool member appreciation events. If you want to come out and have a drink with us at Metazoa, we do floats down the White River. Uh, we do guided trail hikes and things like that. So there's other benefits as well if you just like to get out and have a good time. That is it. I think I went really fast. Uh, does anybody have any questions that I can answer? Any comments? You want to throw anything at me? It's fine. Yeah. yeah. What are we going to start doing with the wildlife, uh, African community with the wildlife? Sorry, I can barely hear you. What are we going to start doing, we start doing with the uh, wildlife? The, the, Wildlife, you know, the Cherokee, the chickadee, and, and stuff like that. Uh, what you gonna start doing with that with the community? You have to come in here, understand more about that. Well, that's basically my entire job. So, the question is, how do we get the community involved? I think with with protecting wildlife. This workshop is a big thing that we try to do, just to get the word out there, to get people hopefully kind of excited, uh, maybe learn a few things, uh, even if you just spark some curiosity, get people to go home and look it up themselves and get involved. We also put on a lot of events, so uh, one of the big things we're trying to do with this trail certification program, the whole reason we want to certify these trails is so we can get people out to them and get programming on those trails. So we would like to have people come, come out and do bird watching, come out and just do uh, uh, ephemeral hikes and look at spring wildflowers, uh, come out and just, just enjoy a lazy day uh, hike. Um, we're just trying to get people more activated on the, uh, the wildlife that we have here in Indiana, on the, on, the, on the trail systems that we have here in Indiana, because I think we're, we kind of underappreciate the trails that we really do have. We have a lot of great stuff in Indiana. I know a lot of us think about wildlife as being sort of, oh, that's out west or that's in Colorado or something like that. But we really have some great opportunities here. And my whole job is trying to get people engaged and interested in you know, coming with me on one of these uh, monarch taggings, for instance, that we're doing, whatever you're interested in, uh, to come out and just fall in love with nature. You know, that's kind of what got me involved in this job, and I'm hoping to pass that on to other people. I try to tell people whenever I do this workshop that if you felt even the slightest bit inspired by anything that you heard, congratulations, you're now an ambassador for wildlife. I can't do this. You know, I can talk to, 
I can talk to groups like this a few times a week, but I can't talk to, to your neighbors necessarily. I can't talk to people that you're just standing in line with at the grocery store or whatever. So sometimes we need people to just casually bring up these conversations and get this stuff started uh, and get involved themselves. And if you want to become a community leader, by all means get in contact me, with me and I will find a way to elevate whatever you're trying to do. Couple questions? Thatcher Park has an eagle. Yeah. There's an eagle nest close by. Uh, is there any chance you're thinking of putting a camera in it? <laughs> you know, that's not something we do, but it would certainly be cool to see. I'm not sure who uh, runs the property, but you can contact them. Oh, okay. Yeah, whoever owns the property would probably be doing it. Do you know what kind of eagle it is? Is it a. It's a, it's got a white head, bald eagle. Well, I guess it's a bald eagle then, right? <laughs> yeah, they're becoming more common. They're very, they're very, uh, a very a very success story uh, here in Indiana. He's been there, they, it's a couple who's been there for over a year. Yeah, they stay for a while. They're, and those nests get <coughs> massive, yeah, yeah. So it's not under anybody's... Anybody can put up a, a video camera? Well, so bald eagles are protected. I, I think there are limitations on how close you can get to them and things like that. It would have to be whoever's, whoever owns the property, whoever's licensed to do something like that. Uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, I happen to have an old doghouse on my property, and uh, I've discovered a raccoon in it for the last few rainy days. Is that a problem, or should I just let them hang out? So I talked about the four needs of wildlife. One of the other workshops that I give is about negative wildlife interactions. So a lot of people don't like possums because they find them going through the trash at 1 o'clock in the morning. They don't like raccoons because I had raccoons get into my attic. It was my fault. I take full responsibility for it. But it was not a pleasant experience. So what I tell people is if you have a, a nuisance wildlife issue, it's probably because you're fulfilling one of those four needs of wildlife, one or more, accidentally. So what you're doing is if it's raining and a raccoon's like, I'm going to go in there, you're providing shelter for them. And of course they're going to take it. I would take it. If I was out in the rain, the only thing I had was a doghouse, I'd go there for sure. What happened to me was I had a big freeze on my roof, and it pulled my eaves away from my roofing and opened up a little access into my attic. And the raccoons decided, hey, it's nice and warm up there. Uh, nothing else is going to bother us. So they moved into my attic. I didn't know that. We had the uh, section repaired, and we trapped them in the attic. So we had to cut a way out, try to find a way for them to get out of the attic. It was, it was a nightmare, but it was because we were providing shelter opportunities for them. With possums, if, if they're getting in your trash, it's because you're providing food, even if you don't mean to. Maybe get a locking trash can or something like that. Uh, so yeah, I would say it's not a problem to have wildlife living in a place that you're not really utilizing. You're basically providing artificial shelter for them. Uh, unless you're not happy with it, with the living situations. Are they still, they're paying rent, right? <laughs> if they stiff you on rent, you can evict them, I'm sure. But, but yeah. Yeah, at times uh, deer come back, but also fox mm -hmm. come into this area. I mean, hell, we celebrate that, but uh, uh, we don't attract foxes or deer. But could yeah, we? if you're, I mean, deer, deer are, deer are a crazy story in Indiana. One of the reasons that Indiana Wildlife Federation was formed was that at the at the beginning of the 19th century, white-tailed deer were al were basically almost extinct in Indiana. And people who were hunting to feed their families thought, uh, our food supply is dwindling here. We've got to do something about it. So they all got together and decided they wanted to protect the white-tailed deer. You wouldn't know it today that they were near extinction because they're everywhere, mainly because they have no predators anymore. We've wiped out uh, coyote, which are starting to come back, which are a predator of deer fawn and things like that. But uh, yeah, if you, have, if you have deer on your property, it's because they've got a safe place to be. Uh, there's no predators for them, nothing to worry about. They've probably got some plants to graze on. If you've got fox, it's the same thing. They love shelter, uh, especially if you have like a storage shed or something that's not, uh, doesn't go all the way to the ground. They will den right underneath that quite happily for a very long time. Um, and there are some species that are doing better as urban wildlife than others. Uh, Coyote is one of them. Not, not necessarily everybody's happy about that, but it's something we're going to have to learn to live with because Coyote range has actually expanded with urbanization. They're not dwindling, they're growing because they're so successful in urban areas. Uh, and it's kind of the same with deer. We don't really do a lot to exclude them. They do really well, there's no predators. Canada goose is another one. Um, they're thriving in our neighborhoods because we provide them with a pond, we build retention ponds for them to live in, and there's no predators, right? Um, in fact, we, we clear all that grass away so that they can see for 100 yards and they've got nothing to worry about. 
So they're quite happy to live there. So we have a lot of species that, yeah, we're just providing great habitat for. Please tell me how you think it's beautiful that Japanese beetles decimate leaves on my plants. Oh, well, I don't think it's beautiful when an invasive species does that. Let me be clear. Yeah, Japanese beetles are an invasive species. They, they are very aggressive. They defoliate everything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, when I'm talking about that, I'm saying like a, a monarch caterpillar devouring a milkweed. That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Japanese beetles are certainly not, and uh, I don't have a lot of pest control advice for them. That's kind of, I, I get asked a lot of pest control advice questions, and what I usually say is that's the reason they're called invasive, because you can't get rid of them. It's just not possible. You can try to control them. You're welcome to go out in your yard for hours at a time and flick them into a bucket of water if you want. Yeah. Um, but you're never going to get rid of them. It's just not something that we can do. Uh, so some we're kind of. Really bad. Some years are not so bad. Yeah, some years are worse than others. Uh, right now, the big one that I think everybody's been looking at is the the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, it's actually a brand new invasive species. So you guys are witnessing the birth of an invasive species. It's only been here for less than a decade, I think. It's only become a problem in the past few years. And uh, if you have a camper or something like that that you store away over winter, you may open it up in the spring and. Oh boy, there's just, they're everywhere. There's bodies in your windows. It's, it's a massacre with these things. And they're, they're hugely devastating to, to crops. They poke holes in all of our fruits and cause them to rot. So that's one to keep an eye on. That's the, the next invasive species that we're going to be looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people are wondering how deer is becoming down in the United States from the wildlife. Uh, could you uh, explain to us how they get down here? How what people wonder how they get down in the neighborhoods. Oh, how, how deer get in the neighborhood? How deer get in the neighborhood? Big old deer, you gotta look like that. <laughs> well, actually, one of the reasons that deer have been so successful with us is, and again, I, I always point back to us. We're almost always the reason. Whenever we have a negative wildlife interaction, we're almost always the reason. Uh, with the thing with deer is they're very unassuming creatures, right? Nobody's afraid of deer, really. Uh, they're pretty gentle. They're kind of shy. Uh, we have habituated them. We've invited them onto our properties. Some people feed them. If you're not feeding them corn, maybe they're eating out of your bird feeders or, or grazing on your plants or something like that. We don't make a real effort to deter them or scare them off. Um, so they've just thought of, they just see humans sort of as, you know, the friendly neighborhood uh, walking ape kind of thing. They don't really care about us. They're not afraid of us. And so they're happy to move into our yards. They'll have their fawns in your backyard. So the, the way the fawn survives is it, it's got that dappled color on its back. It's meant to lay down in the woods and look like it's uh, just a spot of sunshine, right? So they'll just leave their fawns sitting in your backyard for all hours of the day. They know they're pretty well protected. Um, there's no coyotes around, really. To, I mean, they're kind of moving in, but still not as many coyotes as there are deer. Um, our dogs typically don't notice them. We don't notice them. And so they're just real comfortable. So they're happy to move into our backyards. It's just that we're providing a great space for them. Yes, uh, I know that deer that's in, in that neighborhood only come out at nighttime. And I wonder why they did that. Well, they're typically most active around dawn and dusk. Uh, usually in the daytime, they'll leave their fawn by itself and they'll go forage and then they'll come back to the fawn in the dawn or, dawn or dusk around there. But uh, I don't know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's just a nighttime deer. Just loves the nighttime. <laughs> Is that it? Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for, thank you the whole thing. <laughs>